The Catholic Answers Live, the program where you participate with your questions about apologetics and evangelization, including the most important theological, spiritual, moral, and social issues facing the world today. Call now with your question for today's guest. Toll free, 1-888-31-TRUTH. That's 888-318-7884. Now, from San Diego, Catholic Answers Live. Well, it's Friday. We're going to end the week with a double dose of uh, high-octane content. We're going to reach out only to atheists today on Catholic Answers Live. Welcome to the show. one 31 truth is the toll-free phone number. My name is Patrick Coffin, your host. We're only going to open our, our windows and side door and main entrance and roll up the red carpet for atheists only. If you're an atheist, if you believe in a godless universe, if you think Christianity and all theistic religions are Bunk, we want to hear from you. We're only going to take calls from atheists. The hour we've, and the next hour we've affectionately called, Why Are You an Atheist? Again, the toll-free phone number is 888-31-TRUTH. So all theists, Catholic or otherwise, enjoy the show. Atheists or, or agnostics as well, we'll take agnostic callers as well. Give us a jingle. The whole two hours will be uh, devoted to you and answering your questions and dialoguing with you on your worldview. We're going to let you unspool and lay out your case, and we'll have a great conversation while we're at it. Our guest for both hours, uh, appearing now on the internet, thanks to our our camera setup today, is Trent Horn. Uh, Trent holds a master's degree in theology from my alma mater, Franciscan University of Steubenville. He's one of our newest acquisitions as a staff apologist here at Catholic Answers, originally from Phoenix. His his, uh, first book is uh, just getting a final edit, and it's called Answering Atheism. Our, our, Our good friend and boss here, uh, Tim Staples has been raving about it, saying it'll be a, a perennial bestseller. And um, without further adieu to you and you, hey, Trent, welcome well, back. And thank you, Patrick. Yeah. Well, I'm French. I, I did understand what you were saying. Merci. <laughs> May we? <oui. laughs> All right, Trent, the old atheism. People, if you go back far enough in history, back a couple hundred years, you run into pioneers in the philosophical and... Uh, and theological world uh, of atheism, mm-hmm. if, I can, if, if atheism can be reduced to a theological world, a theological world, I should say. Right. You have people like Karl Marx and uh, Ludwig von Feuerbach and Bertrand Russell, and mm-hmm. you get into this uh, last century, Antony Flew, probably the, the highest profile atheist, sure, uh, who converted to theism before he died a few years ago. Um, or I believe it was deism, yes. but yes, he did. Yeah, deism. He, he rejected atheism at the end of his life. Yeah. Of course, we pray for his soul. It, who knows what the grace of God can do at the very, very end. Sure. Uh, um, I've interviewed on this broadcast uh, Roy Abraham Varghese, who was a co-writer in Dr. Flew's last book called mm-hmm. There Is a God. His famous book was called There Is Not a God. There Is No God, I think it was called. So those are the old atheists. Bertrand Russell is another name that comes to mind from the previous century in England. Not now enough you have, evidence y- yeah. is what Bertrand Russell would say about Very, that. very good. Have Not you, enough evidence. Did you hear the 1948 BBC debates between Bertrand Russell and, and the Jesuit Father Frederick Copleston? Oh, it's a it's a classic yeah. if you can find online. It's a very interesting lesson. It, it, it's a gentle English, very English clash of titans. Mm, <laughs> very indeed. interesting. Now we have what what have been deemed the new atheists, Sam Harris, Daniel Dennett, um, our good friend Richard Dawkins, the late Christopher Hitchens, mm-hmm. dubbed by some the Four Horsemen of the of the Apocalypse, have the new atheists gained in in number in raw numbers, or has the internet made their proportion in society seemed bigger? What's your take on that? Before we go to calls, well, I think it's a little bit of both. I think that the internet has given atheists a platform that they never really had before. I think before, mm-hmm. if eight, you know. I think someone I've I've read online, different atheists describing their own subcultures and community. One has said that trying to organize atheists is sort of like herding cats. Mm. Uh, you have a bunch of independent, independent-minded people, and prior to the internet, you know, where do you go to meet each other? Maybe you find each other in the Nietzsche section of the local used bookstore, mm-hmm. but otherwise, there's not really that many places to meet up. But the internet, especially through social network like Facebook and YouTube has just allowed uh, atheism to really explode and create these memes and other ways to reach people, especially young people. Mm -hmm. So I do think atheism is increasing and also just general unaffiliated with religion. But I don't think it's increasing at an an exponential rate or anything like that. Uh, Atheists still comprise a very small portion of society. Mm -hmm. Some surveys say 2%, some as high as 5%. But most people believe that a God exists, uh, it's just the God that is kind of the cosmic vending machine that started everything and is there conveniently when I need him. The original pool player who who broke the uh, 
the balls at the beginning of the game and now either doesn't exist anymore or doesn't care much about the fate of the balls. Right. Unless I'm in a dire circumstance, then it, mm-hmm. it couldn't hurt to ask for help. That's been called moralistic therapeutic deism. <laughs> can't um, believe this is an actual tag for it. Yeah, it was, uh, the, the name was coined by two uh, sociologists. I think it was Christian Smith and Melinda Denton. But I, I've seen this a lot, especially with young people, that mm-hmm. there just is a God, and his job is to make sure I'm happy, and good people go to have heaven, bad people go to hell. But I, I have been seeing there is, there is a growth of just general unaffiliated, that amongst these deists, just mm-hmm. they don't have any religion at all. And it's becoming more and more hip to just jump from that to say I'm an atheist, because... I guess it's the cool thing now. Do you think agnostics, people who aren't sure or don't know mm-hmm. whether or not there's a God, uh, glom onto the atheist title because it's it's got a kind of a hipness nowadays? That they yeah, really haven't I, analyzed their own worldview deeply. R- right. I think that's one of the, if you could call it a success of the new atheist movement, to try to get atheists to, to come out. Mm-hmm. I think a while back on the internet there was a campaign, the Scarlet A, to wear a particular red stylized A to put on your Facebook to show you're an atheist. And, uh, and right, so the scarlet letter of shame. Yeah. So atheism is the new gay, uh, I, I guess, mm-hmm. but just being able to come out and say, you know, I'm an atheist and I'm proud to say that. And we've given, I think the main message of the new atheists like Dawkins and Hitchens and others is that we've given religion too much benefit of the doubt and respect mm-hmm. that the idea is that even if people didn't agree with religion, you just respected it. But now it's time to call it for what it is being silly. And I mean, throughout the history of atheism, this isn't necessarily a new phenomenon. There have always been loudmouth atheists. I mean, you had Robert Ingersoll in the 19th century. Uh, many of our listeners will probably remember Madeline Murray O'Hare. That's right. <laughs> who certainly... Rest her soul, yeah, wherever she is. Right. And I think that some of her um, antics maybe even outdo some of what the new atheists have today. But they were always very marginal. The, you didn't have Madeline Murray O'Hare selling a New York Times bestseller like you know Richard Dawkins and and other people. Right. And it's becoming more and more of a, of a legitimate position to really ridicule religion, specifically Christianity. You and I both know other organized religions. Uh, either you're going to be accused of hatred if you uh, ridicule Judaism, and Buddhism is just kind of a hip thing. No one really ridicules that. And Islam is, well, at your own risk, I suppose. Mm-hmm. It's tempted to follow up on that, but we can't. We're going to take a break and sure. come back. We'll start with Ramsey in Maryland, listening on Catholic.com. Now, give an atheist credit for going to Catholic.com in the first place. Um, we do want to mention that our conversations today will be civil. You will be treated with great kindness. We deliberately target our ideological, quote-unquote, enemies. Our, our Lord and Savior has taught us to love our enemies, and we want to hear from you. Give us a call. Toll-free, 1-888-31-TRUTH, 1-888-318-7884. Why are you an atheist? That's what we want to know. Now, if you're a pew-sitting Christian or you know, you wear a name tag that says that you are, and maybe your family's Catholic, and but secretly you don't believe. We'd love to hear from you too. One triple eight three one eight seven eight eight four. My name is Patrick Coffin. It's ten after the hour. Our guest is staff apologist Trent Horn, who will be back after these words to take your calls. Touching that dial is strictly prohibited. Ah, summer. The season marked by barbecues, sunscreen, much needed vacations, and the general pace of life often slows down just a bit. This summer, you can add to that list the free Catholic Answers San Diego Summer Seminar Series. Learn more today at Catholic.com. Just click on Speakers and Events for full details. Catholic Answers staff apologists Tim Staples, Matt Frad, Trent Horn, and Jim Blackburn will be touring San Diego, visiting three conveniently located parishes, and presenting talks such as The Gift of the Magisterium, How to Win an Argument Without Losing a Soul, Answering Atheism, and Marriage Issues, Wedding, Divorce, Annulment, and Remarriage. Don't take a vacation from building up your knowledge of the faith and your ability to defend and share it. Be sure you make it to several of these inspiring free talks. Get complete details about the Catholic Answers San Diego Summer Seminar Series. Log on to Catholic.com, then click Speakers and Events. The Catholic Answers Minute. I'm Father Vincent Serpa. In Matthew 6, 19... Jesus cautions about storing up treasures on earth that can decay or be stolen. Instead, store up treasures in heaven. Where your treasure is, he says, there is your heart. He also advises that the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is sound, the whole body will be filled with light. But if not, how great will the darkness be? 
In other words, the sense of proper proportions comes from a sound mind, which he likens to a body filled with light. If we are centered on God, then he is our treasure and has our heart. If not, how dark will the darkness in which we live be? There's only one choice, really. We either choose him first, or we choose ourselves. Which will it be? I'm Father Vincent Serpa for Catholic Answers, Catholic.com. Call now with your question, 888-318-7884. This is Catholic Answers Live. We are back. one 888 truth that is the toll-free phone number. Our guest this hour, Trent Horn, will be one of the speakers in our first national apologetics conference. It's happening Saturday, September 28th, and the night before, uh, Friday, September 27th, here in San Diego. We'll kick off the entire weekend with a live broadcast of Catholic Answers Live for you to enjoy. And then Carl Keating, Tim Staples, Jimmy Aiken, Matt Frad, Christopher Check, and our guest, Trent Horn, who will talk about science, necessary but not sufficient. Uh, keynote speaker is Most Reverend James Conley, the, the Bishop of Lincoln, Nebraska. For more information or to register, go to CatholicAnswersConference.com. That's CatholicAnswersConference.com. Great early bird special that goes away in nine days. So there it is. Looking forward to that, Trent? Yes, I'm very excited to uh, meet uh, different supporters of Catholic Answers and to engage the topic that I'll be speaking on, science, how should Catholics view it, uh, and what are the distorted ways of viewing science, either mm-hmm. as science is the savior and vindicator of faith, which uh, some Christians mistakenly think, mm-hmm. and then the other extreme would be science is the destroyer of faith. Uh, science will destroy uh, the expl- that faith gives us the explanations for why we have morality or a soul right. or the universe, that the idea that science will explain everything and destroy religion is also a mistaken view I'll address uh, at the conference, and so I hope uh, many people will attend for that. And are the other speakers whose talks mm-hmm. going to be very, very good? Are you going to have PowerPoint involving Mithra and Godzilla, and battling it out over who's going to eat Tokyo fastest? You know that no. might be a bonus session after the conference or during happy hour. Mm-hmm. But I'm a strict believer that PowerPoint and presentations lowers the IQ of everyone in the room. That it just it saps the life out of people and, and increases the temperature. <laughs> this yeah. is a bad combo. Yeah. All right, we've got uh, listeners and callers, including uh, Ramsey in Maryland, listening on Catholic.com. Ramsey, so glad to hear from you, sir. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Go ahead. What's your question for Trent? Well, I've actually got a bunch of questions, and I don't want to take too much of your time. I know you've got a lot of callers, but I'd like to just kind of read all of my notes. Well, Ramsey, and, we're kind of then, allergic to reading on radio. Why don't you give us your, your five-star objection or the, the five-star thing that makes you go, huh? And and we'll see how that goes, all right? So just tr- trundle out your biggest gun. I, I've got some questions about the nature of God that I would like cleared up so I have a better understanding of him. So I'd like to okay. add some of those. For example, okay. Um, I, I, I have difficulty understanding the omniscience and omnipotence at the same time thing, you know, and I've got other questions like that. All right, we'll start there. Omniscience and omnipotence. Maybe we can define them first for people who never heard those sure. consent words. Uh, omniscience refers to God's ability to know all real or possibly real things. So God just simply knows all true things. He doesn't believe anything that's false. And omnipotence deals with God's ability to actualize any logically possible state of affairs. So God can do anything that's logically possible. The idea with omniscience and omnipotence is that if God is infinite, he's pure act, the fullness of being that creates all of reality. Mm -hmm. He's simply not limited in his knowledge or his abilities to act as long as he doesn't violate his own perfect nature. And so, uh, Ramsey, I'm just curious what do you consider to be the, the explicit contradiction between God's omniscience and his omnipotence? Well, uh, so I've got an example. Like, I, I make websites, and, you know, they have a database and they have records. Uh-huh. Now, if you're my, my customer and you have all the power over the website, you can do anything to the website, you can make it so that you could see every record that anyone ever typed in, right? But then do you have the power to delete the record? If you delete the record, you can never go back and read it again. Sure. You know? In but the analogy, it, are, are you, is God you, the programmer, who's deleting things in the analogy, Ramsey? Yeah, yeah, or the customer, you know, the owner yeah. of the website, yeah. Ramsey, I think I see where you're going. You're saying that God's omniscience requires that he knows all things, but to be omnipotent, you would think, can, can he forget something or choose to 
not remember a certain thing. And his yeah. and so his omniscience would prevent him from doing that. And I agree with you. Specifically suffering. Like, I want the suffering in the past to be erased. But if he erases it, then he won't remember it, and then he won't be all-knowing. Well, let, let's take this one at a time. Okay. First, I would just say that God does know all real or possibly real things, either things that ever have been or ever will be. But God's omnipotence, the idea that he can do anything that's logically possible— it's simply logically impossible for a perfect being to act imperfect. In fact, I have a great quote from Aquinas on this. This is what, what St. Thomas Aquinas says. To sin is to fall short of a perfect action. Hence, to be able to sin is to be able to fall short in action, which is repugnant to omnipotence. So God can do anything that's possible, but a perfect being forgetting something, that would be an imperfection. That's something you and I do because we're imperfect. Since God's mm-hmm. perfect, he doesn't forget anything, and mm-hmm. he's not impotent because he can't forget. In fact, his omnipotence requires him to be perfect, and so he doesn't forget anything. So there's no contradiction between God's omniscience and his omnipotence in the example you brought up. Well, so suffering, for example, has existed in the past, and I, I'd like if I could erase the past, make it go away. Does God have that power to get rid of the suffering from the past? You have asked a question that's actually much deeper than you might realize, because we would have to dwell on what does does the past actually exist? Uh, some philosophers hold the view that the past, present, and future are all uh, equally real, and some people believe that only the present is real. And so the suffering in the past, it's not real anymore. God remembers everything that it was like, but it doesn't exist. I guess I'm curious, why are you concerned about suffering that's happened in the past, God knows everything about it, but he doesn't suffer as he knows it because he's God. What does it matter if he knows that you, for example, suffered in the past? I don't understand. Uh, you know, I've got other questions. I don't want to spend all my time on one question. I'm just showing you that I have some difficulties with, mm-hmm. for example, omnipotence and omniscience. Well, Ramsey, is it possible then, can I say this, is it possible that God could be perfect and unlimited and infinite and he just operates in a way that you and I can't understand. Sure. Okay, so then then I don't think these objections are necessarily good reasons to think there isn't a God, because since God is infinite, we may just have to be modest and humble in what we know and just say that there's good reasons to think God exists and how God functions as God is just beyond our ken. Now, I think we can actually understand some of the basic attributes of God, and most classical theists like Aquinas believe that. So I would just say... Okay. Um, That's hold, hold on I'm, a sec, Ra- Ramsey, Ramsey, just let, let the spear land, okay, and then um, I'll hear back from you. Yeah, so I'm just saying that, that for 2,000 years, theists have really thought over what it means to be God, and there's different modern philosophers that you can read on this question. Uh, you could read Richard Swinburne's book, The Coherence of Theism, or uh, Edward Wierenga's book, The Nature and Attributes of God. So uh, philosophers of religion have really... Uh, thought about these questions a lot, and no one's really found uh, an explicit contradiction in God, and those those sources m- might be helpful for you. Ramsey, thanks for joining us. The question of present suffering, that seems to be a pretty formidable foe to theism. I've never heard the objection that Ramsey raised about the past, because most people say, oh, glad that's over with, but you know, I'm hurt right now. This is going on now. How could this be reconciled with a good God? There's an objection for you. Right, and I'm sorry, it's just the the philosopher inside of me would have loved to spend three hours going down the other direction because it is a legitimate question for people. Mm -hmm. That's one argument that defenders of a theory of time called the A theory would say that the past isn't real, as real as today, because, you know, suffering, we're glad it's over. But in any case, I think you're correct, Patrick, that suffering now is the greatest emotional objection to God, that people think, how can there be this loving God if... There's so much suffering in the world. And I think that while this is a powerful emotional objection, if we can take a step back, we can see there's no logical contradiction in God allowing suffering to bring greater goods from that. And and Mm. one of the callers may bring this up later, and we can explore it more. Ramsey, we're stretching. We're we're reaching out even a little bit further. I think you had one more thing you wanted to add. I have questions about Aquinas. I'm trying to understand Aquinas. I'm trying to understand you guys, you know, reading your guys, reading Edward Fazer. Yes, yeah. you know? he's, he's, a very good, he's a very good philosopher, and he's done a good job of popularizing Aquinas without losing the nuance. So if, if you'd give me a little bit more time, I'd really appreciate it. Well, 
Ramsey, maybe you can bonsai and kind of trim up your uh, comment into a question that Trent can answer because folks have been waiting for a while and I've kept you on longer than normal on purpose. But if you can phrase it as a pithy question, I'm sure Trent can help you. All right. Then I'll try to wrap up what I think are the most important. Okay. I just got two questions. And one is God being the sustainer of all things, not just the first cause of things, but sustaining action and change right now. Mm-hmm. And, and my second question is about adoption being a moral good. All right. So my first question is, if God's the sustainer of all things, does that mean he's sustaining violence or, or dangerous things that are hurting people? Mm-hmm. And my second yeah. question about adoption is, if adoption isn't a moral obligation, but it's just really a nice thing to do, shouldn't more Catholics do it? Or shouldn't things that are nice things to do then become obligations? Like, I think that at the time of Jesus, forgiveness wasn't big, but then forgiveness became an ethical obligation. You know, he introduced it, and it's awesome. So that's it. I think okay. you've, you've, yeah. you've put a, a fairly large pizza in the oven that I don't know we're going to have time to eat through this uh, call, so I'll do my or best. Just Using to... our magical powers, let's make them a cupcake. Yeah, All the pizza into a cupcake. or we could just put it into some kind of a pizza bagel bite and, and eat through this pasta, right? Compromise. Okay, so the your your second question dealt with the issues of forgiveness and moral obligation, and the first one it was about divine conservation. That God is, if He sustains the universe, does He sustain evil things? Well, typically theists have argued that evil is not a thing in and of itself with its own nature. Evil is a privation of the good that God allows to exist for good reasons. Now, it's a real privation. It's not an illusion. Like, you know, a hole is a real thing, even though there's technically nothing there. So God sustains the good in the universe, and he may even sustain physical evils that can cause us pain, but he doesn't sustain any moral evils. Moral evils are a defect in the good in a moral agent. So God sustains all of the good things, and in our actions of being sustained by God, we may indirectly cause evil, but he's not the direct cause of it. And the second question you brought up, I I don't think, I think it's most moral uh, philosophers throughout history have known there has to be a distinction between things that are permissible and things that are obligatory. To make something obligatory puts a huge moral demand on someone. And I think that Adoption is a good because it models parenting, and parenting is an obligatory good. A parent is obligated to their child because that's the natural order of how God has arranged the world, that humans care for one another and they care for the children they create. So that would be obligatory because if parents didn't care for their children, the children would die. Now, adoption uh, is not obligatory for all people. Rather, it's something that society must do. Society is obligated to make sure that orphans and widows are cared for. And so in order to achieve that obligation, an individual may freely choose to adopt. But in doing so, adoption becomes is good because it models the natural good uh, in parenting. But I think on all that, we might have to go Mm -hmm. to another caller. But Ramsey, thank you for your questions, and I encourage you to keep keep reading and exploring. All right, Ramsey, thanks for the call. Let's go to Mark in King City, California on KYAA. Mark, we're probably going to run into our hard break, but if things are not uh, resolved sufficiently, we'll keep you through. Okay, fair enough? That's fair enough. Thank you, Yeah, Mark. I'm an atheist calling Immaculate Heart Radio. How does that work? Go. It's apparently quite fine. God is conserving <laughs> it in being, and we're glad you uh, called. Yeah, well, my question would be, was it God's plan to destroy more Oklahoma with a tornado? And it does say in uh, you know, Isaiah 29, 6, that thou shalt be visited by the Lord with thunder, earthquake, storm, and tempest. Mm-hmm. So I think your guest has answered that there's a greater good, but there were 10 children killed. One of them was four months old. Mm -hmm. To look at that and say, gee, there's a greater good coming out of that is very hard to do, and I don't see the greater good. does sound like a tough sell, doesn't it, Trent? Yes, it certainly does, Mark. And I think we can let let people listening mull over how they would answer that question, and you can hear... Uh, what I think about it when we come back from the break. Can you press pause, Mark? Sure. All right, we'll be right back. This is Catholic Answers Live, two hours of Why Are You an Atheist? We only want to hear from atheists and agnostics today on the broadcast. You're most welcome to call toll-free 888-31-TRUTH. I'm Patrick Coffin. Our guest is Trent Horn, and we will be right back.
It's all about the truth. Catholic Answers Live. If you believe in God, it's possible you've wondered to yourself how anyone cannot believe in Him. But the sad truth is, atheism is becoming more prevalent and more powerful, which means the potential loss of countless souls, including perhaps those of people you love. That's why your friends at Catholic Answers, always on the cutting edge of theological and philosophical debates, has created a brand new audio set that every believer and unbeliever needs to listen to. Phone 888 or log on to Catholic.com today to order How to Talk to Atheists. It's a riveting three-part series of interviews conducted by our own Patrick Coffin. Patrick sat down with some of the country's most influential theists, people like William Lane Craig, who lays out the philosophical foundations of God's existence, Jennifer Fulweiler, an ex-atheist who looks at how to address this issue with family members, and world-renowned Jesuit Father Robert Spitzer, who describes the latest discoveries of modern physics. The Case for God has been nailed in this new audio set from Catholic Answers. Get your copy now by calling 888-291-8000 or by logging on to Catholic.com. Did you know that all of the books, DVDs, and CDs that Catholic Answers publishes can be found as close as your neighborhood Catholic bookstore? That's right. Catholic Answers partners with hundreds of Catholic bookstores across the nation and the world to bring you quality resources in the area of apologetics, evangelization, and chastity from a name you know you can trust. So visit your local Catholic bookstore and see what they've got that's new from Catholic Answers. You can also find us online at Catholic.com. Catholic Answers, the most trusted name in Catholic apologetics. Welcome back to the show. This is Catholic Answers Live. I'm Patrick Coffin. Our guest is staff apologist and writer and speakers bureau member Trent Horn. We're having a great time speaking with our atheist friends. This is two hours of atheism only on Catholic Answers Live. Before the break, Mark in King City had uh, a question about whether or not God intended more people to die in the Oklahoma tornado and more destruction wrought. And you cited a, a line from the prophet Isaiah, Mark. Do you want to repeat that one? Yes, thou shalt be visited by the Lord with thunder, with earthquakes, with storm and tempest, and the flame of devouring fire, which indicates he does these things, and he was behind the tornado, so it destroyed 2,500 houses or so, and killed 24 people, among them a four-month-old child. Well, yeah. To say this is for a greater good is uh, a repugnant idea. It's me. a fair question, Mark. Uh, actually, you've couched it in very kind of ironic terms. You could have gone to something genocidal or the Holocaust right. or you know the mm-hmm. atom bombs in Japan and so on. But right. that's for those who lost lives and who suffered. Mm-hmm. Oklahoma's fair game for that question. Right, and I think, so what you're bringing up is uh, how can we reconcile the goodness of God and his creation with what we might call uh, natural evil or pain? I think what's important is the, the passage you've mentioned from Isaiah, I don't think it's a good idea to apply it to a, to apply it to a current event now. Uh, what the prophet Isaiah and the other prophets speak about when God visits destruction is that God's visiting destruction on a particular people, namely his people established through him with a covenant, and this is like a covenant curse that has been brought upon them. And hopefully uh, this suffering will help them to, you know, that they're going to see the Lord and they're seeing the, the divine justice in uh, some of the wicked things that might occur when they adopt the practices of people like the Canaanites who, you know, practice infanticide and things like that. So one passage in Scripture doesn't necessarily entail why God would allow every single act of natural suffering uh, in the world. But you said something very interesting. You said, I can't see any good reason God would have for allowing a four-month-old to die uh, in in this tornado that happened in Oklahoma. And Mark, I guess what I have a hard time seeing is that to, to have this show that God doesn't exist, I just don't see how you or I or anyone else is in a good position to know there's no good reason. I mean, I'll give you an example. Right now, I'm in a good position to say there are no elephants in the Catholic Answers radio studio because I'm looking around and I don't see any. I'm in a good position to see that. 
but I'm not in a good position to say there are no bacteria in the studio just because I can't see them because I'm not in a good position to see where bacteria are. Much the same way, you and I are not in a position to see how God, centuries from now, or even on other continents, or even in the lives of people affected by these natural evils, how good can't come from this. I think there's there's a good line from C.S. Lewis in his book, The Problem of Pain, that speaks to why pain might be necessary. He writes, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks to us in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Sometimes it's pain and bad things in life that help us become even better people and that we we grow in virtue and in holiness and even in how sad and terrible these things are. Like that four-month-old child who died, now now that child um, is experiencing a beatific vision. Now I'm not saying just, oh, these parents don't have to cry because their child's in heaven. That would be a a cop-out answer. But what I am saying is that we have to take the the entirety of the evidence together, the arguments for the existence of God, how the Christian God can bring good from everything and settle everything in the afterlife. And I don't think your inability to see a good reason, I don't think that's good reason to think there isn't a God because you and I are, are finite creatures. What, what do you think of that response? Well, I think you've had 2,000 years to come up with an answer for suffering, and you've terribly failed at that, and that's why there are atheists. That's why I'm an atheist, one of the reasons. On what, m- say, Mark, why, why, on what point or in what, for what reason do you think his answer failed? Are you just throwing out dicta? What specifically, well, because where's the fallacious he's saying, part? He's saying, gee, we don't know why it happened. Oh, well, there must be a greater good out there somewhere. We can't really tell. This is, uh, you know, destroying a whole city and hurting children, killing people, and then saying, gee, there's virtue that comes after that. You could say that about any evil, and there's no answer. All right, Mark, let me try, let me try this on you. Do you think that um, the existence of God and evil are logically contradictory, that in order for God to exist, there can't be any evil at all? Yeah, it doesn't make sense because it would be part of God's plan. To have evil. Okay, well then I think you were barking up the wrong tree a little bit. Most philosophers divide the problem of evil into two problems. One is the logical problem that God and evil can't coexist in the same world. They're a contradiction, like a square circle. The other one is an evidential problem, which says maybe God exists, but there's so much evil it seems unlikely. So I will say to you, though, that the logical problem of evil, nearly all philosophers agree that, that, that that's been answered that God and evil don't logically contradict. For example, do you think it's good for human beings to have free will so that when they choose to love, it's a real choice, and with that choice, they might also do evil? Do you think that's a, that's a good thing? Yeah, well, I actually don't see that people have free will. I think they're pressured socially, and uh, the Bible says predestinate. Uh, they're well, predestinate. Let, well, let's just leave that out, okay, because Christians right. disagree about what predestination means. Let's right. focus just on this. Mm-hmm. And I'm saying, would you agree that if there is a God, he could endow us with free will? Uh, No, because he sees the beginning and the end. Okay, well, my point is that, do do you think that it's good for us to be able to love people? Can you think of an idea that we could be free and and love is a genuine thing? Is that even something possible you can think of? uh, Yes, of course. Okay, well, my thing is that most people see that, that some evils that exist, we understand them as things that come from goods, and it's okay for God to allow. Now, you as an atheist have a burden of proof. If you're going to say there is no God, and if I can show that evil and God are not logically contradictory, the evidential argument, you were saying, well, I can't see a good reason. Well, you have to show that you're in an epistemic position to search through centuries, through everything else, that God couldn't have any good reasons. Let me ask a more frank question, though. Would you be prepared to believe in God if this this tornado in Oklahoma had never happened? Well, along with 100,000 other things in history that mm-hmm. had uh, not happened, yes, I would. Right, so I don't even think it's, it's not even about that one example, because I could keep right. trimming away evil, and you could always say it's too much, it's too much, and that right. gets us to the logical problem. And I think I've shown, and I think most people who listen would agree that humans have free will. If God creates them, they can have free will, and it's good to allow humans to choose really great goods like the freedom to love or be courageous or sacrifice while at the same time that could be abused. 
and God can allow this, and then he'll remedy this at the end of the world. And I don't think that atheists have proposed really a solid proof that, that there's a contradiction and believers are justified in maintaining that a good God and evil and suffering in the world can coexist. Isn't it true, Trent, that all the kids and all the adults in Oklahoma who were killed eventually would die? Yes, but this is a much true. deeper mystery of why does anybody have to die? What is the, right. the smallest hangnail have to afflict someone? Right, and I, I think that when, when as theists or as Catholics we confront the problem of evil, uh, we have to do it in a sensitive way. I mean, there's two extremes. There is one extreme that just punts to mystery and says, oh, mm. God works in mysterious ways. I'm not even going to think about this problem. Yeah. Um, another extreme would be to say evil and suffering really aren't a big deal. They're, they're, they're privations. They don't really exist. They're not a big deal. Well, th they are a big deal. Blindness, for example, is a real privation of what the eye is supposed to do. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean blindness does not exist. It's very real for someone who suffers from something that's so painful. Yeah. But, but I think, and then the other bad thing is when someone says, oh, well, I can answer, I can answer why God allows such and such evil. No, I can't answer why God allowed uh, this tornado destroyed Oklahoma. I think uh, our fellow apologist, Jimmy Aiken, who's experienced a venerable amount of suffering in his own life, if you read in his own uh, testimony, uh, he, he frames the, the problem well. He says that suffering is a mystery, but we have good reasons that can help us get through it. Mm -hmm. We have arguments to show that God exists, uh, and I can demonstrate those later in the show if other questioners want to know them. And we have reasons God might allow evil and suffering in the world. And one of them may be that so we can have freedom uh, yeah. and so we can form virtue. And I think most people who listen know that some of our greatest moments as human beings, when we're just the fullest of being human and alive, are when we've overcome or endured suffering. And I think mm -hmm. that our world would be a terrible place if God just hooked us up to pleasure machines like the Matrix. Right. And so hockey teams on the first day of practice, they just get handed the Stanley Cup a laurel with no suffer, no kind of blood, sweat, and tears to get there. Right. And what's, what's great is that w from the Christian perspective of theism is that this life isn't the end. I would agree. If this was the only existence we had, the mm -hmm. problem of evil would be very, very devastating to theism. But it, it just it isn't. St. Paul has said that the, the sufferings that we endure now are nothing compared to the eternal weight of glory that lies mm -hmm. ahead for us. A carefully chosen word by St. Paul, nothing. I right. love the finesse of detail there. Yeah, right. Not a little thing, a nothing. And so there's mm -hmm. and so we can we can see how everything will be balanced out and that everything that's happening now will will shape us towards that. And it gives us these these opportunities uh to grow. I think the problem atheists see in the problem of evil is they think God's purpose is to make us happy, and it isn't. Mm -hmm. His purpose is to make us holy. And that his purpose is to conform us so we really become his image and likeness. There's so much to be said about this. One last comment before we hit the break, and sure. we'll come back shortly, is that sometimes suffering or, or privations of, of varying degrees end up being the, the fly in the ointment that becomes like a grain of sand in which everything else rallies around that weakness, that experience of suffering, like the polio of uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Would he have become president of the United States without that other thing to overcome? He certainly overcompensated in his own way. He went far and became a a very successful right. man, or Tom Dempsey, born with one foot, yeah. became a Guinness World Record holder for longest NFL kick yeah. and so because I of that overcoming. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. so I think that when we try to confront God and his goodness and the evil and suffering in our world, we should just avoid two extremes, the theists who say it's not a big deal and the atheists who say, oh, this is unanswerable. Yeah. And I think we can walk a line to see, no, there's no logical contradiction, but it is emotionally powerful and hard. And so along with arguments, sometimes... We just have to be there for people. Mm -hmm. And so that's what life is about. But the fact that we can be there and that people aren't bags of molecules and people matter, I think infinitely counts more in favor there is a God than evil would say there isn't one. Bags of molecules. I like that. Well, if there's no God, sure, of course. Well, why, not, just, why not just say that? We're electric meat. Yeah. <laughs> right? Why not? That goes out of the grave. You could be like Paul and Patricia Churchland, the cognitive uh, researchers who say we don't even have minds. There's nothing. There's nothing immaterial out there. That's superstition. We're just brain states. That's what my 10th grade math teacher said about me. This is bringing up bad memories. Yeah. He has no mind. All right. We're going to take a break and we'll come back. We'll speak with Roger in San Francisco, Carlos in Dallas, Melissa in San Diego. Atheists line up. We'd love to hear from you. We're only taking calls from atheists this hour and the next hour with Trent Horn. 
staff apologist here at Catholic Answers. Trent is also, like myself and Tim Staples and Matt Frad, a member of the Catholic Answers Speakers Bureau. If you want to bring us to any of your uh, events, give us a call at 619-387-7200. 619-387-7200. The toll-free number to reach Trent this hour and the next is one 888 318 Seven eight eight four. I'm Patrick Coffin. You're listening to Catholic Answers Live, and we will be right back. Hi, folks. This is Jimmy Aiken, and I want to let you know about a special offer we have going on right now for Catholic Answers Magazine. As you know, Catholic Answers Magazine is the premier magazine of Catholic apologetics and evangelization. I write for it, Tim Staples writes for it, and so do many, many others. We take pains to make sure that the articles in it will equip you to defend and explain your faith and give you information you won't find in any other magazine. You should sign up today so that you don't miss out on any of the fascinating pieces we've already got scheduled for upcoming issues. You should sign up by going to catholic.com or by calling 888-291-8000. Now, I promised you a special deal, and here it is. If you take out a one-year subscription, we'll rush you a free copy of Patrick Coffin's brand new CD set, How to Talk to Atheists. But if you're able, you really should subscribe for two years because in addition to How to Talk to Atheists, you'll also receive free more than $100 worth of fantastic audio content as MP3s. You'll get Tim Staples sets, Catholic Answers to Common Objections, The Sword of the Spirit, The Staples vs. Greg Debate, and a copy of The Gift of Miracles. That's a talk by Tim that's not available anywhere else. This offer is only available for a limited time, so be sure and subscribe to Catholic Answers Magazine and receive your free gifts by calling 888-291-8000 or by logging on to catholic.com. The story of St. Josephine Bakhita is one of great tragedy turning into beautiful triumph. Kidnapped by slave traders at the age of nine, she was ransomed and taken to Italy where she became a Catholic and a nun. Following her death, countless graces and miracles have been attributed to her intercession. Read Bakita from Slave to Saint from Ignatius Press. Available at 800-651-1531, Ignatius.com or your local Catholic bookstore. Call now with your question. 888-318-7884. This is Catholic Answers Live. Welcome back. Having more fun than canon law permits? Speaking with our ideological enemies, atheists and agnostics, please call us if you believe in a godless universe. We want to talk about uh, the burden of proof, and uh, as we've heard from some of the previous callers, how to reconcile the reality of evil with the goodness of God. It's all fair game, and we want to hear from you at 888-31-TRUTH. Apologist Trent Horn is our guest this hour and the next hour. Let's go now to San Francisco, California, listening on Immaculate Heart Radio. We welcome Roger. Hello, Roger. Hi, um, well, let's just pick it up where the word, the phrase you just used, canon law. Do you know how, where that comes from? I will tell you if you don't, but I'll, do you know? Uh, enlighten me, Roger. Where do you think canon law comes from? Canon law originally comes from an ancient uh, musical device called a monochord. That is where the concept of God originally came from, both for the Jews and the Greek philosophers and the Christians. Uh, actually, uh, Roger, was, that's incorrect. Uh, canon law flows from the teachings of sacred scripture and the need to govern the church uh, in, the, in the celebration of the sacraments and in the life of the church as a governing body. But I have a feeling you have a question about whether or not God exists. What would that be? Well, it, 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 well, I'm, I, well whether or not God exists, I, I'm thinking on one hand that uh, perhaps we don't need, um, perhaps we, we specifically should not insist upon there being a God because, it, because it's the major problem in the world. I think we can do very well without him if, providing, uh, we, we you know, keep three things in mind. And are you interested in those, what those three things are, for instance, from the, an atheist point of view? Very much if they're uh, said speedily, please. Thank you. Okay, speedily. We do need to return to the original metaphor that was the musical octave, the one God, all octaves are one. That's where the Trinity comes from. That's where the Jewish conception of God comes from. That's where the Platonic conception of God comes from. Next, we need the idea of heart and resonance. 
musical again. That is the sympathetic resonance with one's heart and conscience. Number three is the golden rule, to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Those are the three keys. The original, we return to the basics, the original metaphor, where theology and philosophy sprung from, the well, then we need to remember our hearts and then the golden rule. Those three okay, things. Roger, okay, so Roger, Roger have you ever read Aristotle or Aquinas and found this in there? And if you have, I'm curious what part. I have, my friend. It's everywhere. It's have everywhere. You, have you? Well, then it should be really easy to identify, Roger. Where specifically is <laughs> it? Which if part it's of everywhere? Aristotle's physics or metaphysics or in the beginning of the Summa Theologica does Aquinas talk about this? What, what part? It's all throughout Plato. If you read the Timaeus, the, uh, Right, but you see, I'm not, I'm not a Platonist, Roger, that different people come to know God in different ways, and Plato even wouldn't use this argument. But what you said, I find this very interesting. I heard an explanation, an esoteric one, but I didn't really hear an argument, because I could make something similar. I could say atheism came from people who were scared of a divine rule maker and didn't want to believe in him. So we can all, we shouldn't be atheists because people just didn't want God to exist. Do you think that's a good argument? No, I, I'm agreeing with you. There probably is a divine <laughs> a rule maker, but it's, the point is, it's the way we all define it is so different. But that is the problem. Okay, Roger. Here's, we, here's actually, what I, our, yeah. our definitions are not that different, even, even between yeah. Christian and pagan. There is a there is a kind of a coherent similarity I, at least. I, hold hold on a sec, Roger, because I um, no, I would just out. say you gave a, a particular explanation to show that there isn't a god, and you said something I found very interesting that we shouldn't believe in God because he causes lots of problems in the world. But I guess you mean people's belief in God may motivate them to cause problems. That's an interesting sociological question. But from a philosophical perspective, that, that's a terrible reason to say God doesn't exist. What if I said uh, human beings cause a lot of problems in the world, and if we just decided that human beings didn't exist and we stopped believing in them and just each lived on our own in a cabin, things would be better? Would that prove there were no other human beings? I, I'm sorry. This is that that was just a bit of sophistry. That's that's really honestly. I mean, let's get back to to what you know. What Rod, the core key is. Roger, do you, Roger, do you believe there's a God? Do you believe in God, Roger? I have you know bits of a formulation, but like I told you, it isn't important. What's important are well, the three it, key things. Well, I okay, lived. Roger, we, this is not a rabbit hole. We we can afford to go down. But th the last thing I want, maybe you, you were going to go to this trend, and that is the golden rule. If there is no God. Why should I treat Trent the way I want Trent to treat me? Right. Why couldn't I take a baseball bat, say a Louisville slugger, and, and do him in right now if there's no God to, to whom I'm responsible? Right, because, Roger, think about this when it comes to rules. There's lots of uh, different rules out there that we would follow. Like in America, there's a rule you drive on the right side of the road, whereas in London, uh, you would drive on the left side. So why should I, why am I obligated to follow the golden rule? You are obligated by, because it is part of natural law. See, this part of God I do believe in. It is built into the human being. But, but Roger, what part, built, of, what part of God do you not believe in? I specifically do not believe in the Christian, the current, at least, Christian uh, definition of God. See, you're not even talking about God, because the problem with the Christian conception is that we have we then have to believe that Christ, that some guy named Jesus Christ is uh -huh. God. And that's a whole different ball of wax. You're not talking yes. about belief in God per se. You would be talking about the belief in some guy named Jesus being one and the same with God. See, those are two very different things. You're correct. Right. Those are two very different things. But before we would establish that Jesus uh, was God, it would probably be very prudent for us to determine if God actually exists at all, for God to become a man. Otherwise, a man claiming to be God or those claiming a man had risen from the dead, it would just be silly if, if there, there was no God at all. We wouldn't believe that. I just find it interesting you thought that my argument, he thought my argument was uh, sophistry. Um, and yes, it was because it was a perfect parallel of the argument you were giving about why we shouldn't believe in God. Just because belief in God may cause bad things to happen doesn't show God doesn't exist. Uh, an atheist needs to provide an argument not just say a belief has bad consequences. I wonder if the analogy would hold here that it, saying the question of God doesn't really matter is like looking at Starry Starry Night and saying that the existence of Van Gogh doesn't matter that much. It's a fundamental thing whether or not there is a God. 
Right, yeah. The first domino, so to speak. Oh, absolutely. That your view about God and about the universe, your view about the universe and how it functions, and then about human beings and if they have any purpose or are intended for anything, and what happens to human beings after they die, uh, it greatly informs your worldview and philosophy. And so I, I think those are important questions. And uh, people, I think Roger got to an interesting point that people conceive of God in different ways. You could just conceive of a perfect monotheistic God that uh, hasn't been revealed in Christ, and some people mm-hmm. have believed in that. And I just say that de- establishing the existence of that God provides a stepping stone to show God has, has revealed himself. Could you say one reason that we don't believe in multi-gods or even two gods is that that destroys omnipotence? One, If there's two gods, then one god suffers a lack, namely, he ain't the other one. Right, and I think Aquinas put forward a very excellent reason to think that the first cause of the universe or the sustaining cause is not more than one being. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you read Aquinas's proof, such as the argument from motion, that would lead back to a being that is pure act, that sustains all motion, and motion is just when something is potential and becomes actual, and that mm-hmm. chain can't be infinite. And so if a being is pure act, has no potential whatsoever, is this unmoved mover that Aquinas calls God, well, the problem is if there were two beings that are pure act, that have no deficiencies at all, yeah. You couldn't distinguish between them. Right. Because the difference between things is that one thing lacks something. For example, people can distinguish between you and I because uh, I lack uh, having been from Canada or I lack being in the spatial coordinates you're in, you know, a few feet away from mm-hmm. me. Whereas if you have beings that are pure act, they can't lack anything. So there can't right. be more than one there. There would just have to be one. And other philosophers give different reasons based on, uh, let's say, if you believe God created the universe out of nothing, mm-hmm. well, Many uh, medieval philosophers believed that the power to create something from nothing would require omnipotence because there's an infinite distance between being and non-being. Going from the great journey from zero to one. <laughs> right. right. And, so, and so that's that's another way to, to, to think that God would be mm-hmm. omnipotent. Or you could just um, see it seems that God reveals that in his... Um, uh, in the divine revelation. In fact, in the Nicene Creed, the only attribute of God that we profess in the creed is omnipotence, which is very interesting. Uh, we're going to get to callers for the balance of the show in the second hour. I don't want to start one now because we're too close to the break, but I do want to say something by way of teeing up the second hour for people who are able to join us, sure. Trent, and that is the question of where the onus lies. Mm. You often hear from atheists, well, it's on your, it's on your lap. Go, unspool, talk, impress me. But the burden of proof does go both directions, Correct. Yes, I would say that it does, that an atheist uh, hasn't made their case simply because they say, oh, well, there's no good reason to think that God exists, um, therefore, you know, I win, essentially. It doesn't work like that. Theists defend the proposition, does God exist, and say that proposition is true. Mm -hmm. Atheism is the denial of that proposition, saying does God exist is not true or it's false, Now, agnostics would say, I don't know if does God exist is true or false. Uh, Here's a quote from Austin Dacey and Louis Vaughn. Uh, They're two uh, atheists who've written on this subject. They say, what if these arguments purporting to establish that God exists are failures? Uh, Must we then conclude God does not exist? No. Lack of supporting reasons or evidence for a proposition does not show the proposition is false. So atheists can't just say there's no good reason. They have to give a reason to say there is no God at all. Mm -hmm. Roger in San Francisco, thanks for the call. Carlos in Dallas, you'll be up next. I do want to mention my CD set, How to Talk to Atheists, is available at Catholic.com, especially for free, in fact, if you sign up for a year uh, to subscribe to Catholic Answers magazine. All that and much more information can be found uh, at Catholic.com. You're listening to Catholic Answers Live, two hours of atheists only. We want to hear from you. If you don't believe in God, we want to hear why you don't believe in God. We want to hear some solid objections, and we look forward to hearing from you in our number two. Triple eight thirty one truth that's the number. We'll talk on the other side of the break. Catholic Answers Live, the program where you participate with your questions about apologetics and evangelization, including the most important theological, spiritual, moral, and social issues facing the world today. Call now with your question for today's guest. Toll free, 1-888-31-TRUTH. That's 888-318-7884. Now, from San Diego, Catholic Answers Live. Welcome back to hour number two. We're talking about atheism. Why are you an atheist? Venerable Fulton Sheen, who was 
a philosopher as well as a, a Catholic archbishop once famously wrote in his book, uh, Old Errors, New Labels, that uh, anti-cigarette laws wouldn't make any sense unless there was such a thing as cigarettes. Prohibition would make no sense unless there was such a thing as wine and spirits. So if there's no God, what is there to atheate? That's what we're asking. We want to hear from you if you're an atheist. For the balance of the show, Trent Horn is the guest. His new book, Answering Atheism, shall be out in these uh, coming months. Hopefully August, huh? Yeah, probably August is the latest, but we're we're very close. It's just going to, it's cleared apologetic review, and it's just in copy edit, and we have a cover, and it's moving cool. along. So you do conclude in this book that there is a God, correct? Just to clarify. I'm pretty sure, yes. I uh, My thesis in the book is that there are good reasons, there are no good reasons to think atheism is true, and many good reasons to think that it's false. And the, these are, there are rational reasons to think mm-hmm. God exists, and I think it's rational for someone to believe that. That's a good summary, but a bit too long for his book subtitle, you admit. Yes, I think the subtitle we're going to go with is Answering Atheism, uh, Making the Case for God with mm-hmm. Logic and Charity. As we'll try to do right now with Carlos in Dallas, Texas, <coughs> listening on 9, 10 a.m. Hola, Carlos. Hey. How are you? Uh, good evening. Welcome um, aboard. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> great show, great discussion, great topic. It should be a weekly theme. I uh, grew up in an fundamentalist, evangelical Christian home, and even as a kid, I was skeptical, and for me, it I boiled it down to uh, supernaturalism, you know, if there's these claims of angels and demons, mm-hmm. and along with every religion or any claim of the supernatural, I always expected as a child, well, where is it? You know, why isn't Jesus showing up in church? Where are these demons, angels, but, or anything for that matter of the supernatural, whether it's religious or Otherwise, so so for me, that's kind of been a uh, an important part. On top of the uh, counter apologetics, apologetics, all of that stuff that people talk and debate into the night. So for me, where where are the where's the empirical proof of any kind of supernaturalism, regardless if it's religious or anything and whatsoever in any form? Well, Carlos, I think you're you're kind of asking me to draw a square circle. Uh, Empirical proof, I, I think, if you're trying to say where is, like, the scientific evidence for the supernatural, is that uh, what you're trying to say? Yes. Okay. It's, uh, in other words, it's, it, that's why it's called faith, because you have to believe without seeing, and unfortunately, you don't, you're not proven right until you're dead. Well, that just doesn't seem like a very logical uh, idea for, for me. Carlos, do you think that all truth, everything that's true that we believe, is derived from the scientific method? I think a great portion of it in, in our universe, I mean, of course, everything is not understood yet, but mm-hmm. we, we, that's why we aspire to that. Um, I think science does the best it can with what we have available, but the thing about science is we think something, you know, uh, information changes our opinion, and that's all I'm asking for. Religion stays the same. You, you have to believe, you know, hence, therefore, that's why it's, it's the dogma that it is. I think that you've really embodied in this opinion many myths about religion that have, that have been sold to contemporary culture that, that simply aren't true. Uh, if you just look at the history of theology and see how people have grown in their understanding of what God is, how he interacts with the world, that there are philosophers and theologians for over the past 2,000 years you can read to show how people have had a greater time understanding God, what he's like, and how he interacts with people. But I think you've loaded the dice to the idea is that we need to have empirical evidence for something. Well, science is restricted to understanding how the natural world functions, and science offers natural explanations for observed phenomena. So if we're talking about God who exists beyond nature, we'd have to use a different tool than science or empirical investigation. Typically what uh, theologians and other religious people have used is philosophy, or using metaphysics, because God exists outside of our natural universe, he transcends it, we would look for clues within the entire universe itself. The fact that there is a universe that began to exist from nothing, a universe that can fail to exist and needs a reason for its existence, uh, its its design and uh, the moral values within it, that would all be philosophical evidence that points towards a God who created it, that I think is better than empirical evidence because anything we would find empirical, we would just buy, you know we could just chalk up to aliens for all we know. But I think most theologians believe that these these philosophical proofs are pretty powerful and point towards God. Carlos, yes, that was a lot. Well, I 
that that is a lot. And uh, and again, really, I all I know is the the natural world. So by your explanation, what you're saying is every religion must be true then, because if someone believes it, you know, if if a uh, Hindu believes in in Hanuman or Shiva, then there is no onus to prove anything, because that by that explanation, everything is is okay. You know, Thor therefore exists. No. Mm-hmm. And, and Mars, but I, all no, I'm I, saying I, is I live okay. in the natural world. Anything beyond that is does not exist. Wait, 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 Carlos. How do you how do you know there is nothing beyond the natural world? How do we know there is nothing beyond the natural world? Well, it would it would violate the known laws of the universe that we have right now. What laws? I, I don't think it's it's we, asking we, too much. Just Carlos, to, we want to try to keep it concrete and specific. I don't mean to cut you off, but what laws? Sure. Um, Trent asked, which laws would be contradicted? Which laws would be contradicted? But, um, yes. I, I think a, a, any of them, uh, gravity, you know, if uh, Jesus is, you know, does exist and he, he can fly or walk on water, you know, that breaks a couple of natural laws. So therefore, you know, show where's the evidence for that. And I, I don't really even want to get into the Bible because I'm looking at it right now in the 21st century, 2013, I don't really care what claims of the, were made in the past. Yeah. There, Carlos, there fair enough. We no don't have evidence. to. Uh, Trent said this earlier in the first hour. We don't have to go to the Bible. But is suspending a law the same as breaking a law, Trent? Right. No, it's not. For example, if um, I play with my nephew and niece and I say, hey, Jesus walked on water. Do you want to walk on water? And I hold them by their, their wrists and they walk on the surface of a swimming pool. I haven't broken the law of gravity. Merely an outside agent has intervened. Now, God, if he is the supreme being, the act of being itself, and he transcends the universe, and he doesn't exist spatially or temporally, he can interact with the universe, and he can suspend these laws where he needs to. And so there's no contradiction. My point, Carlos, is that you haven't met the burden of proof by simply saying, I see the natural world. I don't see anything supernatural. Therefore, there is nothing supernatural. That doesn't follow at all. That would be like me saying, I see the world around me. I don't see penguins. Therefore, there are no penguins. Well, they live in a place where I can't access them. But we can go see penguins. Okay, fine. Well, I don't see the event horizon of a black hole. Does that mean it doesn't exist? Well, it, it doesn't. That's why it's, it's theoretical. The science says we think there is uh, this thing called a black hole. Until we can go and investigate it personally, well, we, no. We can, it's, it's how scientists discovered Pluto and, and planets beyond Neptune because of the way that other planets were acting, and they were right. It, it, they they proved it. Until then, it was just a theory. Well, Carlos, how about this? Are you thinking about anything right now? Uh, yeah, I'm thinking I'm late because I was waiting on the phone. Okay. All right, well, then I'll make this short. <laughs> I can't see that. In fact, there's no scientific way for me to see that you have thoughts. But I have to philosophically infer that you do based on the nature of what a human being is as a rational animal. So I think philosophy sure. informs us about things and it informs us about science. Philosophy tells us that the world is uniform, even though there's no scientific way to know the laws that function today will be the same tomorrow. And the simple fact that you don't see angels or demons around us, that doesn't show that there's no God that exists. I think that if you look at the universe around, if the universe originated from nothing and came into existence, wouldn't that imply something brought it into existence? I think Peter Crave analogizes a miracle to God being the owner of a bank account, and it's at a certain amount, but he can mm-hmm. add money to the bank account without contradicting the laws of withdrawal in the ATM system. Right. I think it's important that I don't think it's good just to place our faith in God merely on, on, a, on a miracle or a personal interaction uh, you know, something like that. I think most people believe in God because they have a personal experience of God. And I think that's a valid way to know God because if God exists, he can inform people that he exists. Now, granted, you can't share that personal experience. It's mm-hmm. subjective. So there might be other objective evidence. I mean, Paul talks about this in his letter to the Romans. He says in Romans one twenty that God's invisible attributes of power and divinity are clearly made and perceived in what he has made. Mm-hmm. And in Romans 2, uh, he talks about how the law of God, the, the natural law is written on people's hearts. So I think most people throughout history can just intuit there are features of our universe. And we're not, we're not doing this in a scientific way to just use God as a hypothesis. Mm-hmm. Rather, we're talking about a metaphysical demonstration. That's what Aquinas does in the five ways. That's what, what Craig does with the Kalam argument. 
We're using deductive arguments that take evidence around us that, that point back to God. The people listening right now who might be scratching their head over the use of the adjective metaphysical, what yeah. is that? Well, metaphysics is – physics is the study of how things operate in the world around us, how they move basically. So physics mm-hmm. explains uh, why you slip on ice – why things get hot, why planes fly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the study of things, how they interact with each other. Mm-hmm. So that's physics. Metaphysics would be the study of that which is beyond physics or the study of reality itself. So uh, a f- physics may ask the question, um, why does an object uh, retain its speed over time uh, when it's moved? That would be explained with the principle of inertia. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas metaphysics would ask the question, if you take an object like a car – and you replace uh, each part of it over the span of several years, in five years, is it the same car or a different one? Like human cell regeneration and sloughing off. Right. So So metaphysics tries to help us explain what reality itself is. What is space? What is Mm -hmm. time? And why are there things like cars at all? Why are there things? Mm -hmm. I think Derek Parfit is one of the world's most famous philosophers, and he says the first and foremost basic question is, why is there anything at all? I mean, there could just be nothing. That that yeah. seems natural. There's just no minds, no matter, no planets, no nothing. Yeah, Not but, no nothing, but nothing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so why isn't why is there something rather than nothing? Yeah. And so then, if we seek an explanation, that would go back to a being who who explains his own existence, which would be God. Carlos, you made my day with your reply to the question: Are you thinking right now? You said, I think I'm late. I love it. Oh, you're still here. I hope I haven't <laughs> delayed you too much. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I, that's fine. I, I appreciate your time. And, you know, unfortunately, we don't live in a metaphysical world. But my last point is, I think why there's so many more atheists and, uh, and Christianity and religion is actually declining, according to the Pew Research Forum. It's because the ubiquity of things like the Internet, where we can go and, and look for answers, and I think more people, I'm, I'm a teacher here, and so I, uh, you know, and I served in the military, and that's really when I really lost all faith is when I was overseas and saw the conflict in Bosnia and realized that it was a religious war and then started searching for those answers. But now with, with the Internet, people are looking for the answers that I'm to the questions like I'm asking. And now, Carlos, that's, not, that's very interesting. I mean, Would you, let me ask you this, Carlos. Would you say that huh? owning land is a bad thing? Owning or, land is a bad thing? Yeah. Uh, uh no. Okay. Would you agree that a lot of wars and conflict have been over land that people have owned or resources? Uh, sure, definitely. Okay. So just because something is the the source of conflict doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. So just because religion is a source of conflict, it, it wouldn't be bad either. Mm-hmm. So I think that I, I've noticed this a lot, and I think this different people have commented on what has been behind the rise of the new atheism, and I agree with the thesis that a lot of it came out of 9-11, that in 2001, you know, before that, religion is a nuisance, but then uh, people would say, oh, religion makes you abandon reason and do terrible things. That's because so Islam and Christianity are are equalized, and 9-11 is part of the impetus of why the late Chris Hitchens wrote his book, God is Not Great. And it was also the reason Sam Harris wrote the book, The End of Faith. And people say these condescending things like uh, science will fly you to the moon and religion will fly you into buildings. Well, I can turn that on its head and say that religion builds hospitals and science builds atomic bombs. Right. So, I mean, as I've shown these examples, this is common with new atheist rhetoric. Just because religion can be the cause of bad things does not mean it is bad or even false. And I also think this need for we need the scientific evidence. Well, that's scientism. You've got to give me a reason to think all truth comes from science, and that's self-refuting. Rather, philosophy informs us what science is, what the world is. And I think it ultimately points back to to a creator. We're going to take a break and come back in just a few minutes. This is Catholic Answers Live. Atheists only for the balance of the show. 888-31-TRUTH. Don't go away. Hi, this is Father Robert Spitzer, President of the Magis Center of Reason and Faith. And you're listening to Catholic Answers Live. America is in the throes of a great crisis. Political scandals, the war on marriage the coarsening of the culture. The temptation is to become discouraged, even to despair, thinking there's little or nothing that can really be done to turn things around. If you've ever felt like that, you have to make plans to attend the Catholic Answers National Apologetics Conference, September 27th and 28th in San Diego. 
early bird pricing ends June 30th, so log on to CatholicAnswersConference.com and register soon. You'll be energized by our keynote speaker, Bishop James Conley of Lincoln, Nebraska. There will also be rousing presentations like Black and White in a Gray America by yours truly, The Greatest Scandal of All by our senior apologist, Jimmy Aiken, Closing Time for Western Civilization by our founder and president, Carl Keating, and Science, Necessary but Not Sufficient by apologist Trent Horn. This promises to be an event you'll never forget, one that will inspire you to go forward with courage and confidence as you do your part to transform the culture in Christ. Sign up today for the Catholic Answers National Apologetics Conference this September. Remember, space is limited and early bird pricing closes June 30th. Log on to CatholicAnswersConference.com for complete details. Call now with your question. 888-318-7884. This is Catholic Answers Live. Welcome back. Atheists only. Trent Horn is the guest. Melissa in San Diego, California on Immaculate Heart Radio. 1000 AM is the next caller. Hi, Melissa. Thanks for hanging in there. Hi. Thank you for having me. I'm really nervous, I have to say. Uh, (laughs) Melissa, it's just you and I and Trent and billions of people judging you. Oh, thank you. Um, Go ahead. I'd actually um, like to start out by saying I'm more of an agnostic, mm. and I truly want to believe. Um, I came up, I grew up in a liturgical background. I was baptized and, conver- and confirmed in the Episcopal Church, mm-hmm. um, but I felt pushed out, essentially, um, by the Bible and what the Bible says mm. about um, women, women and um our inherent inferiority to men. Melissa, do you have a Bible there? Um, I could, I could well, get one. Yes. Well, you don't have to go get it, but can you remember a chapter or a verse or a book? Because this is this is a very important claim and, and issue. I, yeah, I have a pen and paper in front of me. I actually wrote yeah. down what I was going to say. <laughs> Excellent. That's okay. Do you have them now? Yes. All right. Right. Well, I'm glad we had this I, I, talk. I, right. Well, no, I, I think I, oh, I understand no. what you're talking about. There's, there's such as uh, usually these are in Paul's letters that uh, oh, people I'm hone sorry. in I on. Thought, I th- you were asking me. Yes, I, yeah. I do. I was talking about uh, specifically Corinthians. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. Passages. Yes. Uh, Paul's letters. Um, I feel like Paul was the biggest misogynist offender as far as. Um, the uh, apostles and um, whatever, what, where else? Wives submit to your husbands. Um, well, Melissa, it's kind of like, have you ever been to a movie and it, the poster said, quote, dot, 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 a great movie. Then you go to see the movie and it's horrible and you want your money back. And then you read the original review and it says such and such is not a great movie. They just left out the not part. You're taking a little segment of one passage from one book and you're kind of elevating it out of context. But I want to kind of frame it this way, Trent. Trent. Um, Paul's attitude toward women was culturally conditioned to a certain degree, and the Church distinguishes between the things that are culturally conditioned and the things that are more eternal, at least Mm morality-wise. And the greater context of how women were treated in ancient Israel, period, before the coming of Christ. Because Ephesians 5 is, is, to me, the Magna Carta of women's equality with men as long as you don't take the one little half a sentence that Melissa did. Oh, right. Okay. I, I think there is a smaller issue, Melissa, and a larger issue that would be interesting to discuss. One would be that when people talk about what Paul is writing in these letters, and there's actually some neat articles on our website you may find helpful that my friend and fellow apologist Jim Blackburn has written. One is called, Is It a Doctrine or a Discipline? And I think another is called, Was St. Paul a Misogynist? Uh, and in Paul's letters, there are other parts where he does describe women uh, speaking or prophesying in church. For example, the early church uh, had deaconesses who helped assisted at baptism because uh, there, there were both male and female assistants for baptism. Sometimes they might be in the nude. Uh, and so women did have that place. And I think in these circumstances, what we have is not necessarily a doctrine, 
but a discipline Paul is is issuing so that Christian churches aren't confused with other mystery religions that had uh, female leaders and engaged uh, in very, very nefarious things, things like orgies and, and the like. So that's the smaller matter. Okay. The, the larger matter, though, is um, this one problem. So you would describe yourself as an agnostic now, someone who's just not sure if there is a God or not. Yes, sir. I, I just feel alienated as a woman a lot uh-huh. from the church because of bi- the Bible and, and specifically, yes, the, mm-hmm. uh, the Apostle Paul. Sure. But I guess how would it follow that there are some things in the Bible that seem to disparage women? How would it follow from that uh, that there, that we can't know if there is a God or not? I mean, how would that affect? Wouldn't, couldn't we still believe that God exists and um, maybe certain portion of the Bibles are, are, are inaccurate. Like, how do you make the leap from the Bible says things you think could be perceived as bad towards women to we can't be sure there's a God? Doesn't that seem like a kind of a big leap? I, I guess I would say that's where I'm an agnostic is because so many um, Christians and Catholics <clears throat> will point to this, uh, these passages. I'm sorry, I'm ill-prepared for this. They'll 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 point to this and no, no, say that women, women need to be kept silent and and whatnot. Um, Maybe and I just s- don't I don't. Let me try how- some right. Let me try something interesting here. So you're talking about you know misogyny. Would you say that it's objectively wrong for men to use hate and treat women like objects? That that's objectively wrong. It's Absolutely. A, like it's a fact. Yes. Okay. Well. What if our culture changed? I feel like our culture is actually very misogynistic now and that women are kind of basically only seen as being valuable for what they can do for men, whether they're, you know, nubile and and other things like that. Even if the whole world thought that women were just objects and didn't really matter and women just were brainwashed and believed this, would that all still be wrong? That's a really good question. Right. I hadn't really thought about it like that. Because here's my thing, that if there is an objective moral order, if there are some moral rules that are true, regardless of what people think about them, it would follow that these moral rules would come from a source that is perfect, that is moral itself, and that is unchanging, and is the same in all times and places. And for me, what makes the most sense would be that, that that would be God, and that if God existed and created humans and said... I've created in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, God makes it clear he made man in his image, male and female, he created them. Now, what's interesting, okay. well, the thing about how interesting is that that, that one little phrase is in there because someone could easily try to twist that and say God made man in his image. Oh, yeah, he made men. Y chromosomes. The, the men are in God's image. But the writer in Genesis makes clear he made man male and female in his image. So the equality between the sexes, I think, makes sense under under a religious viewpoint. But otherwise, if God doesn't exist, then there's no moral framework to say men and women must be treated equally. We all would just be I kind of mad emotion. I, I think where um, I need to be more specific is the fact that, okay, all I can know of God mm-hmm. or Christianity is what's in the Bible and what people tell me by word of mouth. You know, I can't know what God thinks. I can't know. There's no way. So if I I can counter somebody who said, well, uh, God wanted women to subject to their husbands and do whatever they wanted them to do and be secondary in the household. So, but I can say, well, I could point to. Uh, there's just no way of countering that except with more things that other people have said that God says or thinks. It's a you little, understand what I'm saying? Sure. Melissa, it's a little more definitive than that. I want to recommend a website called Women Think for Themselves. It's, um, excuse me, womenspeakforthemselves.com. It's based on a book and a movement by Dr. Helen Alvray, law professor. The book she wrote, edited, is called Breaking Through, Catholic Women Speak for Themselves. Please call anytime uh, again, Melissa. I hope that was a help. we got to go. Atheists only on Catholic Answers Live. Be right back. 
It's no secret that young people today have been losing their faith in droves. How many parents and grandparents have had their hearts broken by seeing their children and grandchildren abandon the faith? But what if someone could give you a tool that would help you reach the teens and young adults in your sphere of influence? You'd grab it up in a minute, right? Well, look no further, because Catholic Answers has produced a resource unlike anything we've done before. The Truth is Out There is a brand new graphic novel that uses the power of words and pictures to deliver the truth of the Catholic faith. A graphic novel with high quality illustrations and a storyline that's easy to follow. The Truth is Out There follows our heroes Brendan and Irk as they travel through time and the universe, discovering the meaning of life, the existence of God, Jesus Christ, and finally, the Catholic Church. Get the young people in your life talking about things that matter. It's a whole new way to reach a whole new generation. Order your copy of The Truth Is Out There today by calling 1-888-291-8000 or logging on to Catholic.com. If you like to keep up on the thoughts of well-known Catholics, chances are you have bookmarks for dozens of your favorite bloggers. It's always good to get a variety of different perspectives on issues that you care about. Well, now there's a place where with just one click, you can get a glimpse inside the minds of an all-star lineup of prominent Catholics. Introducing the Daily Blogs at Catholic.com, where you can get the rock-solid Catholic position on current events and more from people like Carl Keating, Tim Staples, Jimmy Aiken, Patrick Coffin, Hector Molina, Trent Horn, Matt Frad, Peggy Fry, Christopher Check, and more. With those great thinkers posting on our blogs each day, you're sure to find several topics of interest every time you log on. Check out the blogs at Catholic.com today. Welcome back to Catholic Answers Live. Special hello to our loyal podcasters. My name is Patrick Hoff, and we're taking calls only from atheists. For the balance of the show, Trent Horn is the guest, staff apologist at Catholic Answers. Stay tuned this summer for his upcoming book, Answering, a- Answering Atheism. Available right now is my three CD set called How to Talk to Atheists, available at Catholic.com. Let's go to Les, also in San Diego, also listening on Immaculate Heart Radio, 1000 AM. Hello, Les. Hi. Uh, you guys have a great show. Thank you. And uh, I guess uh, listening to everything you guys are talking about, it's really hard for me to focus on my question because there's so much good stuff you're talking about. But uh, for one thing, how can the burden of proof that you said uh, be put on an atheist to show that there isn't a God, how can you show, how can you prove something that you don't believe in? How can you prove that nothing is there? I don't understand that. Well, you can prove that something doesn't exist by either showing that the thing in question is a logical contradiction and so could not possibly exist, or that the thing in question uh, contradicts a known fact uh, that you do know is true. Uh, So, for example, I know that there are no square circles uh, or colorless shapes because those would be logical contradictions. If someone could show God was a contradiction, then he wouldn't exist. Uh, I also know that um, there are, like I gave the example earlier, there are no elephants in the Catholic Answers uh, radio studio because that would contradict the fact that I am being appeared to no elephantly, as the philosopher Alvin Plantinga would say, that there's no elephant okay. in this room. I can, I can see everything. Now, you might rejoin, yeah, well, ah, <clears throat> but you can search the whole radio station to see if the elephant is there, but you can't search the whole universe to see if there's a god or not. Right. Yes. Right. What was that? So that atheist doesn't believe that there is a fact that there is a God, so how can he prove that there isn't, considering he doesn't even see that there's a, you know, he doesn't see there's a fact that there is to go by to show that there isn't. But right. To contradict. Exactly. So that's what I'm saying. Now, what, what many atheists might try to do is they'll say that God contradicts the fact of evil or suffering, and we discussed that, I think, in the yeah, previous no. hour. No. But But here's... Yeah. What I would say is I would agree with you, and so the atheist can't show there isn't a God, and so atheism can't be held as a tenable position. Rather, the only position one could hold would be agnosticism and say, there could be a God, there may not be one, I have to simply wait to see if there's more evidence. Similar to the fact that I can't show there are no forms of extraterrestrial life in the universe, that doesn't prove there are no aliens, just that 
I'm agnostic to the question and have to wait. And so I think an atheist, if his only reason to be an atheist is that there's no compelling evidence for him to think God exists, then I think he should just be an agnostic and just patiently wait to see there might be more evidence. Well, you know, and, and so this is why I love your show so much, because most everything, most everything you're saying just makes sense. And, you know, that's why I'm I take telling that as a you, high compliment. <laughs> uh, yes. And that's why I'm telling you right now, I'm sitting here as an agnostic, actually mm. an agnostic Jew, if you want to put a label on it, but sure. an agnostic. And uh, so that's, I mean, to me, an atheist is, is, can't prove anything just as much also to me that someone can't prove. Mm -hmm. And that was my next question to you is I thought you said that uh, you can uh, bring up one or two things that can prove that there is proof that there is a God. And I'd like to hear that. Okay. Uh, Excellent question, Les. Now we kind of get to the nub, don't we? Yes. Do Christians just believe in the uh, Richard Dawkins invisible flying spaghetti monster or the substantial positive yeah. proofs for now, God. I believe that was Bobby Henderson of Kansas who came up with the flying spaghetti monster, though has been endorsed by Dawkins in, in some... Uh, but wasn't Bobby <laughs> Henderson Dr. Dawkins' original birth name? No, maybe not. <laughs> now we're getting into conspiracies. <laughs> so you're right. that it, it, One could be an agnostic and say, well, there's no good reason to think there isn't a God, but if you can't give me some good reasons to think there is one, I'll just stay here and suspend belief. I think there's there's a lot of different reasons that well think, not good re- not good not good reasons to think that there is one but a good uh, a good reason to know that there is. Are, are oh. you looking for a proof for God's existence, Les? Uh well, uh, sure. I would okay. love to see that. I it's, mean, I wouldn't. Yeah. I was hoping for the word yes from you. Just okay. Then. <laughs> yeah, I want to be very clear when people uh, talk about proofs for God that a proof typically a proof can only be one hundred percent in fields like mathematics, where we have right. different axioms we already assume to be true. And so then we just put those together and we get the proofs, like A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Yeah. Rather, the proofs that a theist may offer for God would just be compelling reasons that okay. form in an argument that that lead to God. And now someone could rationally deny one of the premises in the argument. They'd have to give me a good reason to think why they would. But I would say on the whole that they they give good reasons, and knowledge is just having justified true belief. So if I believe God exists and it's true, and I have a good reason, well then I could say I know God exists, even though someone might disagree. I guess here I'll give you I'll give you I'll give you a simple one, that probably one of the simplest ones. This is called the Kalam argument. Whatever begins to exist has a cause for its existence. And we know this through uh, intuition and induction, that something doesn't come from nothing. Uh, premise two would be that the universe began to exist. And we can know this philosophically and scientifically. Philosophically, we would know that an infinite past would create logical contradictions. Uh, for example, it would be impossible to arrive at the present moment to traverse an infinite series. And we could find scientific confirmation for this from the Big Bang Theory and even from general relativity, which seems to show that in any universe, even if before our Big Bang there was another universe, uh, if that universe is, is expanding like ours, there would have to be a beginning there as well. So if whatever begins to exist has a cause and the universe began, then it would follow the universe has a cause. And since the universe is all space, time, matter, and energy, the cause of the universe can't be material or temporal because it made those things. Yeah. So it would have to be a cause that's immaterial, temporal, powerful, that exists on its own without a cause. And, and most people say that that's God. And so I find that compelling. I think if you believe both premises, the, the conclusion naturally follows. So what would you what would you well, think of an argument like that? Uh, thank you for asking. <laughs> I was hoping you weren't going to hang on at that point. Um, yes, I, and this is where my stance is. Uh, I am an agnostic uh, to the point where I believe there is some sort of supreme being, uh, but I can't tell you the details. So, you know, I look around, I see, I look, I think, and from everything that I take in, Mm -hmm. I come up with the idea that uh, I do believe that there is something, but uh, my point of view is that uh, we either uh, don't know for sure what it is because we're not supposed to know, or we don't know because we can't conceive of it, Mm -hmm. or, you know, maybe a couple other things, but, so I can't tell you the details, but I do believe. That's very interesting, Les. So I, actually, your position 
um, would be closer to what's called deism, that there is a being that brought the universe into existence that's not material, not temporal, uh, exists of its own nature, has no cause of its own, and hasn't gone out of existence. Well, maybe it's gone out of existence, but you would believe no, there was... No. <laughs> right. That, that's what the deists believe. They were people like uh, Thomas Jefferson and many of the founding fathers. Uh-huh. So uh, you've slowly moved on the, the scale a little bit because agnostics wouldn't even cede that point. So as a deist, you would say, well, I believe there was a first cause of some kind, and I'm not really sure. I can't really know much uh, about this cause. And so that's where other reasons for the existence of God would maybe help fill in the details for us a little bit. Yeah, can I say one last thing? Sure. Go ahead. Okay. So uh, your one caller, uh, you, you asked, well, do you think that uh, uh, there would be, if there was a God, would he uh, uh, give us free will? And I was surprised to hear, and he was an atheist, mm-hmm. I was surprised to hear that he said no, because there would only be a beginning and an end. And And I thought to myself, if he's an atheist and says, I don't believe, then how can he know that there, that God would have a beginning and an end only, uh, uh, you know, in order to have, there wouldn't be any free will? How, how can he know that if he doesn't even believe that there is a God? Sure, Les. And I, how I think can he know that? He'd, right. have to, he'd have to call back and answer for himself. Good question. Yeah. I was going to uh, thank him for his call and see if he would say, you're welcome, <laughs> because... If there's no free will, he really shouldn't be thanked because he was determined to call. Right. I think the caller was bringing up a very, very old objection that says that if God omnisciently knows future truths about how we act, that those truths can't change. And so we we don't have the freedom to change them. And theologians have uh, really written on this problem a lot. And there's different ways of solving it that basically just because God knows something, it doesn't follow that his knowledge determines what I'm going to do. It's merely right. the case that I freely choose to do something mm-hmm. and God knows I'll do that. If this I had, fre- I right. And if I had freely chosen to act differently, it would simply be the case. God would know something different. So there's, there's yeah. not really, there's, there's no, um, uh, distinction there and different philosophers have come up with different solutions to that. So is, yeah, let's is your show, go is ahead. Your show on every, is your show on every week like this or this it's, is just a one time deal? It's on every 10 years and we're so glad you made it to the small sliver. <laughs> of no, we're, we're three, uh, two hours a day, three to five uh, Pacific time on 1000 AM where you're, you're listening less. We're also on the internet, uh, Catholic.com forward slash radio. We're also on channel 130 on Sirius Satellite Radio. We have listeners around the world. We know this because they call from time to time. Um, by the way, Catholic.com is our website, Les. I really hope you hang out there, do a keyword search. And I'll, I'll leave you with this. One of uh, our regular guests, or he's been on the show before. He's one of my mentors in life, Dr. Peter Kraft. He's one of the foremost Catholic philosophers in America. He teaches philosophy at Boston College. He has a book that we offer here called Handbook of Catholic Apologetics that he co-wrote with a Jesuit named Father Ron Ticelli. Chapter 3, Les, is 20 Proofs for God's Existence uh, from Thomas Aquinas and, and the Kalam argument that, that um, Trent alluded to. And just the the other month, he was on talking about the role of logic and apologetics. I'm not sure if you caught that show, Trent. But mm-hmm. I said, Dr. Crave, which of the proofs do you find that people who are, say, undergrads, resonate the most with. And I thought he was going to say the Kalam argument or Thomas's uh, argument from contingency or design. He goes, actually, the Johann Sebastian Bach argument. Oh, I burst out laughing because one of the proofs, I thought I took it as a joke. The proof goes like this, Les. You'll appreciate this. There is the music of Johann Sebastian Bach. Therefore, God exists. And he says, you either get it or you don't. And the reason he said it's so powerful is that it, when people listen to Bach and other beautiful, uh, brilliant composers, it does evoke a sense of wonder that does have the the strange feeling to it, that it's otherworldly, that there's something beyond mm-hmm. our temporal bounds of space and time. Gless, um, I like it. Yeah, call back any time. You know, we have different topics through the week. Okay. We have Q&A open forum, and I was secretly hoping that your last name was Ismore. No. That is that would be too cheesy. No, I've heard too that much. before. I, I probably five billion times. Mm-hmm. Let's call back yeah. again. All right. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, sir. You know what's yep. interesting, Patrick? Um, people might ask me what are some of my favorite proofs or proofs that I find very compelling mm-hmm. uh, to believe that God exists. And I'm and there's lo- I mean there's lots of different arguments. There's even more than the twenty I think that the creep is is listed. Sure, but it really does affect me a lot at an, at a personal level. Actually, yeah, beauty that when I just see 
something's just beautiful, like, you know, Patagonia or the music of Bach. Uh, or Mother, my, Mother Teresa. Or I was going to say my wife mm. or um, anything else. You know, it's something just say, yep. well, no, there has to there has to be more. And, and I know it's a very just direct, intuitive argument, but it really moves me a lot. And the other arguments have their, their force as well. I think an atheist may counter, ah, yeah, but what, so the argument from beauty shows there's a God, but maybe the argument from ugliness shows there isn't one. Mm-hmm. But I think what's interesting there is that we only notice things are ugly because they lack the beauty they should have. Right. It's a backhanded compliment to beauty. Yeah, kind of. It's other, a profession of something yeah, that isn't Otherwise, we, we might just simply say, we would just describe things factually and not mm-hmm. notice that they should be the way they are or not. And so even ugliness itself, and that's one of the arguments that evil is evidence for God, because mm-hmm. it's very difficult to define evil. If you just define it as something you don't like, well, look, exercise is an evil, even if you don't like it. Uh, so yeah. it's, I think a better definition for evil is not just something we dislike or makes us feel bad. Evil are the way things should not be like the second or maybe the third Brady Bunch movie. Right. Yeah. To get <laughs> really into different. Oh yeah. So, so if some evil. things, if evil are the way things are not supposed to be, that implies things are supposed to be a certain right. way and implies a designer. Yes. We shall segue to a break. A quick one. We'll come back and speak with Rachel in Columbus, Jim in Maine. Lots more to come on Catholic Answers Live. We'll go to a neither beautiful nor ugly break, but a factual one, and be right back. What could be better than expanding your apologetics and evangelization knowledge by learning from Carl Keating, Tim Staples, Jimmy Aiken, and our other staff and outside writers who contribute to our award-winning Catholic Answers magazine? Here's what. During our annual subscription drive going on right now, we're going to lavish you with free Catholic Answers resources. Sign up today at 888 or online at catholic.com. When you take out a one-year subscription, we'll include a copy of Patrick Coffin's new audio set, How to Talk to Atheists. Become a two-year subscriber, and we'll do even better by sending you a custom Catholic Answers 4GB flash drive containing over $100 worth of content, including our audio sets, Catholic Answers to Common Objections, The Sword of the Spirit, The Staple vs. Greg Debate, How to Talk to Atheists, and The Gift of Miracles, which is a presentation by Tim Staples that's not available anywhere else. That's a value of over $120 absolutely free when you sign up for a two-year subscription to the most popular magazine of Catholic apologetics and evangelization. So, subscribe to Catholic Answers magazine before our annual subscription drive ends. Phone 888-291-8000 or go to catholic.com today. The Catholic Answers Minute. I'm Father Vincent Serpa. In Matthew 6, 19, Jesus cautions about storing up treasures on earth that can decay or be stolen. Instead, store up treasures in heaven. Where your treasure is, he says, there is your heart. He also advises that the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is sound, the whole body will be filled with light. But if not, how great will the darkness be? In other words, the sense of proper proportions comes from a sound mind, which he likens to a body filled with light. If we are centered on God, then he is our treasure and has our heart. If not, how dark will the darkness in which we live be? There's only one choice, really. We either choose him first, or we choose ourselves. Which will it be? I'm Father Vincent Serpa for Catholic Answers, catholic.com. Call now with your question, 888-318-7884. This is Catholic Answers Live. Yes, it is. One more segment, Atheists Only, starting with Rachel in Columbus, Ohio, on St. Gabriel Radio. Hi, Rachel. Hi guys, how are you? Good. You know, you you win the Patience Blue Ribbon Award. Thanks for hanging in there, Rachel. Oh, a lot to me. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Well, um, I originally called based on um, you know burden of proof that seems to have been kind of um, you know beaten to death so far. But um, I and you have well, to pardon me. I might have my sources right now because I don't have any internet. But um, oh, that's okay. You know, we we we've got a dead horse here. Pile on. <laughs> Beat away. Um, there was, uh, I think it was Dawkins who said, um, uh, what was, oh, um, that you are basically, if you're a monotheist, you're an atheist to all other gods of all other religions. And um, when you realize, when you basically use your reasons for being 
uh, hold on. Uh, when you use your reasons to be atheist against those other gods, I just go one god further. That's a very sloppy version of what I believe was Dawkins. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I can imagine that Dawkins uh, said something like that. Uh, that's called. Not sure. <laughs> Are you asking Trent to comment on the? Validity or fallaciousness of that statement, or do you have, it was just a, well, another yeah, thing you wanted to say? Like, I have yeah, some well, thoughts I, on that if yeah. you'd like to hear. Oh sure. Um, well, another thing. Uh, Peter Kreeft was on um, Patrick Madrid's show yesterday, I believe. Yeah, it was yesterday. Yes. Uh, I like to think of him as Patrick Coffin Light. Not nearly as funny. Ooh, but, um, I, I love that. I, I the great Boro, the the good Boro, the great Steel. <laughs> Go ahead, Rachel. <laughs> yeah, and and so, Doctor Kreeft said what? Yeah, uh, well, basically he said, and I think you guys have kind of um, been saying this too, but basically in order to be an atheist, you have to know everything about everything in order to prove, you basically, again, again, burden of proof to prove that there is no God, but you guys obviously don't do that when it comes to Norse mythology or Zoroastrianism or any of those things, mm. but, you know, who's to say that um, Mazdahura doesn't mm. exist? The god of the god, of, right? The 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 good god. Well, that, that's the that's the. I thought that was the bad god of Zoroastrianism. Yeah, um, I think Mazda is the good guy. Yeah. Right, right, right. I, 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 and the Korean I, I, car company. I, right. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, let me take a, a stab at this. Yeah, that's called the "I believe in one less god" argument than than you, basically. And it actually goes all the way back to H. L. Mencken. Uh, who is a very famous uh, satirical uh, news news reporter of the early 20th century. Yeah. Uh, and he's just a very witty gentleman and very pessimistic about any way to know anything. I think he said that uh, philosophy is a blind man in a dark room looking for a black cat that isn't there and a theologian. Yeah. And a theologian is the man who finds the cat. Yeah. Uh, those who can do, those who can't teach. I think he said that. And, may, uh, and those who can't teach, teach teachers. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so that might be Mencken. And so he, he said something, where is the graveyard of the dead gods? You know, where there was a time when people worshipped Zeus or Jupiter, the, the king of the gods. Now nobody does. Um, you know, our god, the god people believe in now is just like them. The problem with this argument is that just because some versions of God are no longer believed in, or most people consider them to be false, uh, it doesn't follow that all versions of God are false. For example, just because counterfeit money exists, it doesn't follow there's no real money. So there, the reason that I disbelieve in these other gods like Zeus or Thor or Quetzalcoatl or who name you, uh, isn't because I just don't want to believe in them. It's that I think they don't exist. One argument I would give to show that a particular being doesn't exist would be that it's logically contradictory. For example, I would say that God, if he created the world and created moral values, and he's the fullness of being, what Aquinas says, pure act. There's no deficiencies in God whatsoever. So he's the moral perfection. God would be morally perfect. Uh, I can't believe in a God who's morally imperfect. And so, so what I couldn't believe then are gods like Zeus. And if you read ancient Greek mythology, it seems like Zeus really only has one thing on his mind, and that's turning into an animal and seducing somebody. So I, even if you go back to people like Aristotle and Plato, the ancient Greek philosophers, they didn't believe in these gods either. Uh, Aristotle, he writes in his book Metaphysics that from ancient times, people came up with these gods, and these are just stories that people added for myth. But Aristotle does believe in one God. He says that he believes in a living being, eternal, most good, so that life and duration uh, have their continuous and eternal, and they belong to God, for this is God. So what I'm saying is that just because there are some gods I don't believe in, I don't believe in them because they're imperfect or they're contradictory, uh, doesn't follow there isn't a perfect, infinite God that created the universe. And even when you go back, Plato and Aristotle believed in this infinite God, even though they rejected gods like Zeus. So I just believe in the same kind of God they did. Is that a helpful response? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I get where you're, you're coming from, but I, I do believe that you're probably very selective. Again, I know you guys, you, I, I probably missed it, but you addressed the problem with, uh, you know, allowing evil and all that. Uh, right. There is some, again, I can't say the name of the philosopher offhand, but just said some axioms like, if... Um, if God is capable of preventing evil and knows about it but doesn't, then he is malevolent. If he knows about it but is unable to, he is omnipotent. If he is both, 
then why call him God? That would be right. uh, David Hume, the famous Scottish skeptical philosopher's summary of Epicurus's ancient objection. Yeah, Rachel, uh, I'm not sure if you heard the first hour. You can get it on our, our podcast, but avoiding for the moment the question of evil, mm-hmm. you mentioned in the first hour, Trent, in one of your answers that even if there were two gods, that would kind of fall apart because one god would have the, the would lack being the other god. Right. You just said it in a smarter way than me. <laughs> you increased the IQ of the show instantly by your answer. But that goes to Rachel's question about why we don't believe in, in multifarious gods, even more than once, one too many. Right. That, that two gods could share certain things, just as, let's say you and I share equal levels of intelligence, but we can't share everything. We can't share the same spatial location. We would cease to exist. Right. So... Uh, I think that it makes more sense to say that one God uh, who's perfect in being created the world because if he's the fullness of being, he lacks nothing, he shares nothing with others, his omnipotence isn't frustrated by another being's omnipotence. Mm-hmm. And Zoroastrianism is, is uh, essentially a dualistic religion that that posits there's a good being and an evil being of equal power. And that might explain some things in the world, but uh, it really doesn't when you get at it at a philosophical mm-hmm. level. One more caller, Jim in Maine on Catholic.com. Welcome to the show, and thank you for holding. Hi, thanks. Knowing and believing are two different things. I believe there's no God, but I do not know that there's no God. Agnostics do not know that God exists. Atheists do not believe God exists. You can be an agnostic and an atheist at the same time. Right, yeah, and I think that's just if you try to divide up knowledge in certain ways. and Like, if you treat knowledge as justified true belief... So you're saying that um, an agnostic doesn't know God... Do- Wait, atheists don't know God doesn't exist? They just believe he doesn't? Yeah, atheists don't believe God exists. Right, and but my thing is, I don't really care kind of what people believe. I'm just trying to figure out what's true. And so I want to try to find the answer to a question, and the question is, does God exist? And so that question could be answered yes, no, or maybe. How would you answer that question? Uh, <laughs> this God, he, he's a being of pure actuality? An infinite, perfect being who's the creator of the universe, all-powerful, all-good, yeah? Pure, pure act itself lacks nothing. Which, I don't believe in him, right? Like, so, I right, but actually I, could when, believe in him. Sure, so Jim, what's the answer to the question? Does God exist? Is it yes, no, or maybe? I'm going to say no. Okay, what... Well, well, what evidence do you have he doesn't exist? Because what I think is something that exists is something that explains stuff, and I don't think he explains anything that I can't explain without him. Do you, well, boy, I wish, we, I wish we weren't at the end of the show. I was going to ask about the, the world itself. If, if a painting requires an artist and a building a builder, the world itself... Yeah, and, I, and, it and my arguments for God don't merely posit him as just some explanation because I don't get something. God is the rational conclusion of philosophical arguments that point mm-hmm. back towards him. But I, I think this shows that atheists can't merely say theists haven't made their case. If they want to say the atheists say God does not exist, they have to present an argument just as theists do. Yeah. Jim and Maine, thanks for the call. Last thought? Yeah, if you want to read more of my articles and really find how Catholics are getting on the internet to present the truth, my friend Brandon Vocht has a great website called strangenotions.com to bring Catholics and atheists together. And I think that we'll, we'll catch up on the internet where the atheists have been. So visit, ca- yeah, visit catholic.com and strangenotions.com to learn more. Monday, Q&A open forum for non-Catholics. Thank you, Trent. For me and everyone else, be a saint. What else is there? <laughs>